It says, uh, yes, thank you for allowing me to have a Hisvados on my birthday. L'chaim, L'chaim, everyone. Uh, thank you very much. And I uh, just want to share a few thoughts. Um, I'm sure like many of you, you probably saw recently the reported story about uh, Rabbi Beryl Lazar's recent visit to uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu. If you didn't see it, let me just give a, a short recap. It went something like this. Rabbi Lazar was asked to meet Netanyahu in Israel. And uh, when he gets there, uh, Rabbi Beryl asks uh, Netanyahu, he asks Bibi, when was the first time you met the Rebbe? So he says it was Simchas Torah, Tav Shemem Dalad, 1984. So Rabbi Lozar says, yes, I was there. I remember there, but talked to you for 45 minutes before Hakafas. When did you say it was again? He's looking at him like he's a little crazy. Simchas Torah, I told you. He says, when did you say? He says, you were there, you know, like probably if you had to sort of picture the scene in the room, probably annoyingly so, he says, Simchas Torah. And then it hit him like a ton of bricks. Simchas Torah, 40 years to the day, before one of the most catastrophic blows to Am Yisrael and Dar Ashvi, the Rebbe held up HaKafas for 40, 45 minutes to talk to Benjamin Netanyahu about standing strong. So that was the story, at least as it was reported in the reputable Chabad news outlets. I don't know, fake news or real news, but that was the way it was reported. And the reason I'm sharing it is because it hit home for me. I was talking to a Chabar, it really hit home for me, especially as you asked me, Rabbi Kaplan, to talk tonight. Tonight we're talking about preparing children for Yeralifness, and I think there's a very, very, very important lesson and sort of shift of perspective in this story. You see, we often think of ourselves, we think ourselves, and when we tell this to our Talmudim, we tell it to our children, we say, the Rebbe is also your Rebbe. He cares about each one of you and every one of you. You know what we're really saying? This is what we're really saying. We're really saying the Rebbe lived, he fabringed, he gave dollars, he gave a rois from Yud Shvat Tavshin Yud until Gimel Tamus Tavshin and Dal. And because the Rebbe lives on after his passing, so those Fabrengans and those Hayroyes and those Abrachas, you know what, Kindlach, they also apply to you guys. That's sort of the message we're giving, and we, and we think that way. And this story, it hit me like a ton of bricks. It really, it's an illustration of a paradigm shift that I humbly suggest we have to change the narrative, at least in our own heads. In other words, it's not that the Rebbe is also their Rebbe. The Rebbe is Ersht their Rebbe. When the Rebbe was talking to Bibi in Tavshim and Dalid, Maybe he wasn't talking about Tavshim and Dalit, or he wasn't only talking about Tavshim and Dalit. Maybe he was really talking about Tavshim and Pei Dalit. Maybe his words were meant for him to stay strong now. In other words, the Rebbe didn't speak those sikhas and brachas then. He, this is your Rebbe, Kindalach. It's not my Rebbe that, hey, he's also yours. And this attitude, I think if we, if we adopt this vis-a-vis -vis our Talmidim, then this is their Rebbe. And their Rebbe is having a birthday in one month. It's not my Rebbe that I'm sharing with you. And in a certain sense, by the way, if the Rebbe is the Rebbe of Dor HaShvi, of Ikvaseh the Meshicha, then these kids might more amply qualify as Ikvaseh the Meshicha Chsidim than we do. Maybe when the Rebbe was saying those talks, he was actually talking to the kids. And then we, as the Malamdim, as the Machanchim, as the teachers, as the parents, were there to tell the kids, this is your Rebbe's birthday. And once you see, once I begin to see it through those lens, then I talk about the Rebbe in that way, and then it comes through, it's their Rebbe. And then as Rabbi Goldberg just says, well, once it's their Rebbe, well, I'll tell you what, I came home from Chabad last night, and all my kids instinctively said, happy birthday to Tati. No one had to tell them, my wife didn't have to prepare them. It was, it was exciting, because it's their Tati, their Tati's having a birthday. So I, I think this is just a, a uh, and I think it actually, if, if we think this way, then I, I'm, it's just a fabrengen, Rabbi Kaplan said it's a fabrengen, so uh, I think if we think this way, then it actually it rubs off, and I think it's a paradigm shift that we have to have, you always hear saying, people saying, it's also your Rebbe, the Rebbe is also here today, the Rebbe is erst your Rebbe, the Rebbe is erst here today, and if we convey that to the children, so this is an idea that uh, I was, was sort of uh, ruminating as, as, as you were asking me, and, and uh, I remember my father once told me, Allah Shalom, uh, my father, as you know, was the Rebbe's doctor. He married it to be the Rebbe's doctor after Tavshin Lamed Ches, the Rebbe's heart attack. And in the days after the heart attack, after Rosh Kislev, after the Rebbe went home, so the Rebbe still had to undergo what we would call physical therapy, getting the heart stronger again. And so the Rebbe would walk from his house to 770, and first a block, then two blocks, then three blocks, and either Rabbi Klein or Rabbi uh, 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 Krinsky would be driving alongside as the Rebbe was walking and my father would have this course of, of uh, accompanying the Rebbe on these walks and he spent literally countless hours with the Rebbe and I used to I always ask daddy what did 
you talk about it. And, you know, usually he would say nothing. I just didn't want to impose and didn't say much because it's not my place to say. He had a chavrusa. He he was a bachra at the time, so he would learn in seven seventy with a bachrim. And when they would they would sort of learn sichas with him, hoping that he would ask certain questions on sichas. You can look in sichas kedush. There's certain conversations. But one time, my father had really seen one or two fabrengans, and he asked the Rebbe, like, how does the fabrengan work? What what's the system for the fabrengan? Like, who decides how long you speak for? I know it sounds funny. How many talks are there? When when do you say the mimer? When is the nigan? Who decides which nigun? Because like. Who, who runs it? Is there maybe a format that's been passed down for generations on how a Fabrengan is sort of run? And obviously the Rebbe with a very big smile, I think it was on the corner of uh, New York Avenue and President, and the Rebbe turned around and with both hands says, uh, I do, that's my job, I do. And I, 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 it's, it's a cute story, but in a certain way you can be sitting there in 770 at the Fabrengan and you cannot realize who's running the show. The fact that we can't see it nowadays, it's well, not necessarily clear to everybody then at all. Here we are. Yes, it's many years later. Yes, the Rebbe still, my Rebbe, he's your Rebbe. He's having a birthday. And there's a sense, and when we talk about Hachan, I'll just conclude with this. There's a certain sense of urgency. There's a certain sense of an anticipation that's building. I remember once my father was asked, he didn't like talking about his time with the Rebbe. If you wanted to talk to him about intracellular ions and nuclear magnetic resonance imaging, he loved that stuff. He would talk to you. You couldn't get him to stop talking. But when it came to stories about the Rebbe, he didn't like doing that. But I remember we lived in, in Detroit. My parents lived in Detroit. Then Rabbi Shemtev, uh, he should be well. I asked, asked my father if he could come to speak to the yeshiva. So I, he, he couldn't say no to Rabbi Shemtev. He comes in and he had questions and answers and whatever it was. Someone recently gave me a tape recorder, a recording of that, of that talk. Um, and afterwards, uh, one of the boys asked him, what was it like being around the Rebbe the whole time? So my father gave a real imagery that I'm sure the Detroit Bachan would appreciate. He said, let me give you a football analogy from the Detroit Lions, not knowing maybe that that wasn't, they weren't up to date. He said, you know, when you play football, both teams are playing really hard, but then there comes the two minute warning. And when you hit the two minute warning, both teams go into an overdrive mode. They go into this mode of all hands on deck. We'll do every single thing we can to make this happen. He says, being around the Rebbe was being around somebody who lived life after the two-minute warning. There was an urgency. There was a palpable energy. There was some, we have to make this happen. And I, I saw this. I know my kids have this in Detroit Yeshiva. I'm not in the classroom myself, so I'm not as experienced as many of the esteemed uh, Machanchem and Malamdim on this. But I know in the Detroit Yeshiva, they actually have a countdown clock that's counting down till Yud Aleph Nissen. How many days, how many hours, how many minutes, and I don't know if it does how many seconds. And it certainly, it creates a certain urgency, a certain anticipation. So if we have this notion, Rabbi Kaplan, you said some people don't like going beyond themselves. The whole message of Yud Aleph Nissen is Yud plus one to go beyond yourself, to have a sense of urgency. If our children feel this is their Rebbe, it's my birthday, then you know what? My kids have been planning this birthday for me for a while, deciding which cake I like the best, giving me the cake I need with the chocolate, with the frosting, without the frostings, all the Abisha Helfen, that we shouldn't be have to, to have to talk about this. We shouldn't have to convince ourselves and think and fabring about this, but we should see that this is the Rebbe, this is their Rebbe, and we'll celebrate Yerala Finstein together with Malkeinu Bereshenu, L'chaim L'vracha, Breeder, thank you very much for having me, and Atzalach Rabbah.